give up in order to follow Jesus? We get a couple of takes on that question in today's gospel lesson. Jesus and his disciples are journeying from Galilee to Jerusalem, and this happens. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man went up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come. Follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields of persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Where do we fit in? Our nation's Supreme Court is back in session, and now with a full complement of nine justices, we await their upcoming decision. This is the highest court in our land. The Supreme Court hears appeals from lower courts. Of the millions of cases tried throughout our 50 states each year, a mere handful make it all the way to the Supreme Court. Back in Old Testament times, Job was appealing to the Supreme Court. Job was begging for an audience with Almighty God. We Christians and our Jewish ancestors believe in a justice system that even surpasses our great country's Supreme Court. Almighty God is our ultimate judge, and Job is crying out for a hearing with God. I hope you took me up on my challenge to read the book of Job this month. That's the Old Testament text that T. Worrell and I will be preaching on for the next couple of Sundays. It's not the easiest reading. It is one of the oldest stories in the Bible, and it presents a timeless problem, the problem of evil. You may remember a popular book from the 1980s written by a Jewish rabbi, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. This author was wrestling with Job's dilemma. Where is God? I don't know if you've gotten as far as chapter 23 in Job yet, so here's a quick summary. I'll admit it's not the easiest reading in the Bible. After the opening two chapters in which Job, a blameless and upright man, in which Job loses everything, then we encounter a very long form. The next 40 and one half chapters are written in poetic style. We quickly meet three friends of Job, Eliphaz, Bildad, 
and so forth. Those are not a bunch of county names. All three are convinced that Job has done something terribly wrong and God is punishing Job. It's almost like a court scene. A friend will accuse Job and Job will refute their claims. First Eliphaz, then Bildad, then Zophar. By the time we get to chapter 23, we're in the third cycle of these accusations and passionate refutes. God will eventually grant Job his day in court, but that's jumping ahead. For today, Job is desperately seeking God. Job is trying to get his so-called friends to shut up long enough for Job to plead his case before what appears to be an absent and disinterested God. Do you ever feel like God is absent in your life? Do you, like Job, cry out to God but never seem to get an answer? This is an age-old problem. And I sometimes ponder the wisdom of the sage who said, if there seems to be a growing distance between you and God, who moved? Is God hiding from us, or are we running from God? The overarching story of the Bible is one of God, Almighty God, moving toward us, providing for us, forgiving us and welcoming us back into the Holy Covenant. This becomes supremely true in the gift of Jesus Christ. But again, that's jumping ahead in the story. Back to Job and his friends. The three friends are operating from an ancient assumption. God rewards the just and God punishes the unjust. So Job, they wonder, what have you done wrong? What are you being punished by God for? That's not the God we Christians believe in. But even our Savior Jesus Christ cried from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This old wrong-headed method is used to try and make sense out of a too often senseless world. I am guilty of this wrong thinking. <coughs> Probably in many ways, but the most apparent is my thinking about poverty. I am quick to judge what we label as welfare mothers. Too often I think of those who come to the food pantry as lazy. God forgive me, I know better. But like Job's friends, it's easier to blame someone else than to face my own prejudices. How many of us are simply one missed paycheck or one late retirement check away from financial problems? Many of those desperate for housing after Florence's floods were not only working, they were working two or three jobs just to pay the rent and to put away a little something to one day have their own home. And now they have nothing. I need to stop judging and start helping. They are crying out for an audience with the God I believe in. How can I help them to believe as well? Job is difficult reading, but it is important reading. Our God does not function on a rewards and punishment system. Thank God for that grace. God is love. God suffers alongside of each one of us. God rejoices in our salvation. God weeps at our destruction. If God seems a long way off, who moved? Job was searching for God. We are searching for God. We cry out for the God of justice, but it is the God of mercy who we need as our Supreme Court justice. May God be merciful. May God be present with us today and tomorrow. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And may we give the glory to God, the God we know as our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer. 
and be healed. Having heard God's word read and proclaimed, we respond as people of faith by declaring what we believe. Today I invite you to stand with me and using the words of the Apostles' Creed to once again share our faith. Let us stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood on the right hand of God the Father. This shall come to judge with the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our worship together continues in the prayers of the people. Before I leave this in a passionate prayer, I invite us all to take a few moments in silent personal prayer time, open our hearts to God, to ask for God to be active in our lives, to ask for God's guidance as we move on to the busy week ahead. And then following that time of silent prayer, I will lift up a prayer of thanksgiving and invite you to join your voice with mine in the back in sharing our Lord's prayer. So let us all pray to our loving God first in silence. Almighty and ever-loving God, God of Job and his friends, God of us and our friends, hear our prayers. Help us, O oh God, to believe in your loving presence. Help us to share that hope with everyone, the rich and the poor. God of all nations, we thank you that Michael's winds blew quickly past us, but we are mindful of the terrible destruction in Florida's panhandle and the deaths in Georgia and the Carolinas and Virginia. Help us, O oh Lord, to help those who have lost so much. We pray, too, for those recovering from Hurricane Florence's unwanted visit. We pray for wildfire victims in our western states and for flood victims in New England. Help us as a nation to help our needy citizens and help us to not forget that we are a beacon of hope for so many in our troubled world. Guiding God, we pray for our president and all who advise him. We pray for peace in Syria and in Afghanistan and in her neighbor, Pakistan. Be near the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, as well as those starving in Yemen and Somalia and North Korea. Bless those working for the Red Cross and for Samaritan's Purse, for church world services and the many helping agencies determined to make our world a better place to live. Inspiring God, we thank you for our choirs and our musicians. Teach our Sunday school teachers and our Bible study leaders and our youth advisors as they teach us. Guide our deacons and our elders as they guide us. We pray for T. Worrell, our seminary intern, as he works among us. Call us all to be winsome witnesses to your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Healing God, we lift up our loved ones who need your amazing grace today. Be known in hospital rooms and on operating tables, in nursing homes and in memory centers, in rehabilitation programs and in prison cells, even in hospice beds. We pray for those battling cancer and those living with Alzheimer's or AIDS or depression or diabetes or addictions. May our prayers and our visits be used for your glory, loving God. 
Hear us now, Heavenly Father, as we conclude this public prayer and begin another week of private and family prayer by joining our voices together in sharing the prayer Jesus taught to his first disciples. Make us more faithful disciples and more helpful friends today as we pray our Lord's Prayer. Praying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn of dedication this morning is hymn number 724, O Jesus, I have promised.
We have been blessed to gather together in freedom today. May we become a blessing to this community who are challenged to serve and share the good news that God is in our midst, that Christ walks alongside of us, that the Holy Spirit is there to help us. So go forth, my friends, be ambassadors for the love of Christ. Indeed, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. The peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you this day and forevermore.